Welcome back to the Crackcast. Uh, you know, recently we've had some great conversations uh, with some guests that we invited because, well, we thought it would be uh, good to ride the wave of the Krakow Jewish Festival, uh, which is just uh, finishing up today, in fact. Uh, we spoke with Jonathan Ornstein of the Krakow JCC. We spoke with Marciana Kubala of Hillel Krakow and Eva Hussein of the Australian Society of, of uh, Polish Jews. And they were all excellent guests. And we here at the Crackcast, we learned a lot from them and... Well, they're all uh, very welcome to come back sometime if you're listening, guys. But as much as we have learned, there are still lots of questions we have about Judaism, being Jewish. And I think many of you listening probably uh, share some of the same questions. Listening to our previous interviews, you may have noticed that being Jewish is really complicated for reasons that it would take an expert to explain. Well, we are extremely fortunate to welcome to the studio today just such an expert Rabbi Avi Bamal is, well, a rabbi, and he has graciously, very graciously agreed to join us today to explain some of the basics of Judaism in an episode we're kind of calling everything you always wanted to know about Judaism, but were too lazy to ask. Rabbi, welcome to the Crackcast. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. We thought we'd uh, start by uh, asking you to explain uh, what type of rabbi you are, which which uh, sect of Judaism do you follow, and the differences maybe between the three main branches. Yeah, there there are sects and there are different denominations. Um, I'm actually part of a new sect called Cool Rabbi. <laughs> it's the you know Orthodox or conservative reform and the cool guy. So that's that's my basic. Uh, I'm actually uh, called Modern Orthodox, which is like traditional, but I wear colorful socks, so you you know you, you once you do that, there's no turning back. <laughs> it's so a brave I'm, new world. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, the story of uh, different sects of, uh, of orthodoxy, you know, of Judaism. It's the last few hundred years, actually, for thousands of years, you were just a Jew. You know, uh, there might have been a difference between Ashkenazi and Sephardi, like if you were Middle Eastern or you were a European, so you had kind of different songs and different uh, language uh, barriers. But on the whole, everyone kind of like believed the same thing, and they did more or less. That was the idea, that you basically, you know, there's Judaism, you're supposed to do a lot of these things, a lot of commandments. Some did more, and some did less. And then came along a few hundred years ago, uh, the Reform said, no, no, no we want to stand firmly in believe that, you know, you don't have to do everything. You're not even supposed to do everything. We have a different take on what it means to be Jewish and what it means to observe the commandments and the laws and the Torah and all these kind of things. So they were a departure. And they really, like, in the beginning, they rejected all the, the traditional uh, um, commandments and the like. Came along the conservatives and said, no, 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 let's not go crazy. You know, let's kind of find a middle ground. Whereas it's traditional, they held the line. Um... The idea of holding the line, that's still prominent in, uh, in the Orthodox traditional idea. But um, it, Orthodox is a big, it's a big, uh, huge kind of camp. And uh, it basically means you observe the written law, Torah, and you observe the rabbinic interpretation of it in terms of the 630 commandments and all the minor commandments and everything that goes along with it. And therefore, you're not willing to go on like on this departure and say, you know, I don't accept this, I don't accept that. At the same time, there are ultra-Orthodox, Hasidic-looking Orthodox. Mm -hmm. And then there's modern Orthodox who engage with the world, who have an open and uh, kind of like a more... Uh, welcoming and and uh, engaging attitude, and uh, that's where I find myself. That's where the cool socks come in. <laughs> that's where the cool socks are. It, that's my dress code. So yeah. if we could take it back a little bit, I, I was reading up a little bit. You studied in, in New York, was that right? Maybe you could uh, tell us about your own journey and how you ended up in Krakow. My journey begins with my grandparents who were rabbis, or my grandfather and great-grandfather, and many generations of rabbis before me in Poland. Oh, wow. And what happened was, it was very interesting. My grandfather is a, speak, is a rabbi in Szczawnica Krzyszczenko, which is like this town an hour and a half away. It's, the, it's like a, a resort town. And all the rabbis would come and hang out because of the cool air and the good water. And they would they'd have this meeting of the minds. My grandfather was um, requested or they sent a telegram from New York. And they said, listen... You're hanging out there in Poland, all the Jews there, all the religious, all the scholars are there. We need help. 
we need someone to come and breathe some life into this place called Brooklyn Crown Heights, which is funny today because that's considered like the, you know, the home base, but not in 1930. So he gets an, an invitation to come to, uh, to Crown Heights and he becomes a rabbi there for 30 years. And because he's in New York, my father's from New York, I grew up in New York. And uh, fast forward 80 years and I'm living in Israel in the heart of Jewish life and the Jewish uh, scholarship. Uh, and I get a call from the chief rabbi to come back to Poland to help out with Jewish life. So that's uh, pretty wild. Um, but growing up in, uh, in New York, I was a mono-Orthodox kid. I grew up in uh, Riverdale in, uh, and in Great Neck, Long Island. I went to day school and um, lived my life. I went to camp. I, uh, you know, I was a Mets fan. Um, I have a complex that I uh, never really won. But then came 86, <laughs> and we were all excited. And then we've been waiting ever since. Mets, Mets fan. Mets. Uh, okay. <laughs> Is that part of the standard journey, or is uh, I think it usually goes Yankees fan? Well, it? you know, we Jews like to be the underdogs, and uh, it's important that we. <laughs> well, so you I, chose I, the right I cho team. I chose then. the Mets, Knicks, and 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 Jets, and I and uh, you I, know all about lot, underdogs. Then don't there's you? a lot of under going on there, and um, recently, ironically, I became a Golden State Warriors fan, but that's another story. Um, you needed a bit of relief. I did. Yeah. I did. <laughs> Let's jump into some basics here, Rabbi. Uh, the Talmud, the Torah, what are they? How are they different? Why are they important? Okay, here's the, here's the 411. The, uh, the 3,500 years ago, the, uh, the Jewish people are, uh, are gathered, and having left Egypt, and they're standing at Mount Sinai, and Moses said to them, that and they have a revelation with God, and God tells them, You got to accept these commandments in order to be my people. And if you be my people, then you will be kind of like a light into the nations. That's the deal, okay? If you accept it, then you become my chosen people. If not, I'll go find someone else. And uh, the people say, um, The people said something really silly at the time. They said, We'll, we'll accept it. And then we'll find out what it is, which is, uh, you know, not the way you want to go. You don't sign and then read the contract. But that's what they did. It's a famous, <laughs> it's a classic Jewish tale where they said, Na seven ishma, we will do it. And then we'll find out the details. And that was a great leap of faith for them at the time. Now, uh, they, they didn't really know all the details, and the details were written down in the Torah scroll. That's the five books of Moses, all right? The tradition is... An orthodox position is that Moses received the word of God uh, at Sinai and throughout his life, he wrote down this in these five books. Um, and uh, in it, you know, there's some history, but there's really laws. There's a lot of laws, commandments, do right, do good. And there are two types of commandments, the commandments that you are to do to God, uh, for God, and then the commandments you're supposed to do for your fellow man, like be a good person. So these were, and we, can, we classically call them the 613 written word of God, the commandments. Ten commandments that you're familiar with, commandments about uh, ritual sacrifice, and the commandments about slaughtering, and the commandments about eating kosher, and the commandments about observing Shabbat. And here's a great example. The Torah doesn't, uh, doesn't give us a lot of information sometimes, and therefore, if it's a finite work, that's written down, kind of engraved in stone, then you need someone to interpret it. You can't, you know, read something. The Torah says, for example, on the seventh day is a day of rest. Don't do work. Now, there are a million questions about what that means. You know, what is work? What work to me means something different from work to you. How do you define what work is? How do you know, how does it go? So um, the Jewish people have been a people that have questioned from time immemorial, constantly questioning, and we need answers. We need to know what to do and how to live our lives. And there, thereby comes along Moses and the prophets and the rabbis who are the interpreters. They are the interpreters of the written word, and that becomes the oral law. The interpretation of Moses saying, oh, work means this. It means you can't write, or it means you can't plant, or it means you can't build. Um, then, then that becomes the written word, 39 different uh, activities. Now, the next generation, they say, you know, someone comes and says, you know, Moses is gone. They say, okay, you can't write, but uh, 
Are you allowed to, uh, um, you know, write in the sand, you know, or, or is it just on the paper? I say, oh, that's a good question. And then there's another interpretation. They try to try to explain that. And then the 2000 years later, they say, can you type in a keyboard? And someone needs to answer that question. And that is the oral law. And that's the Talmud. So that is the Talmud begins the question. And we've been asking questions ever since. What's the Jewish conception of the afterlife and heaven and hell? So that's interesting because, you know, the five books of Moses are very practical. They're very um, present. They're talking to the Jewish people in Egypt on the way to the promised land. Very little esoteric, very little mystical, very little talk about there's no resurrection and there's no afterlife and there's no heaven, there's no hell, there's here. And now how you behave towards your fellow man, what you need to do. The... Rabbinic interpretations followed along, but over 2,000 years, the mystical explanations and the, the additions of, and some superstitions, that all kind of added on to the body of, uh, of the original source. So that there, there's the answer that it's something that was kind of came along and added on um, in time, and there's no one clear definition or, or understanding of what's happening. I think we're going to have to wait to find out. I want to ask you a question that I know it's an unfair question because I know there's no good answer. And I know that Jews themselves argue endlessly about the answer. I want to toss it out there anyway. Uh, what is a Jew? Is it a, is it a racial designation, a religious, ethnic, all of the above, none of the above? I don't think it's a very difficult question. I, no? I think it's a, it's a pretty uh, clear understanding of what a Jew is. Um, it's someone who's born or chooses to join a uh, a religion that follows a, a code of ethics, a code of law, and uh, has traditions and, and follows follows it and lives their life accordingly. You can't just call yourself a Jew. It doesn't work. You have to be born into it. Uh, according to the Orthodox tradition, you have to come from a Jewish mother. So if, if your mom's Jewish, your grandmother's Jewish, you're Jewish. In Poland, we have a more expanded version of it, that if your father's Jewish and your grandfather's Jewish, you're also accepted. Wait, even if you don't follow Jewish teachings, you're Jewish? A hundred percent. You know, you can be, you know, any, uh, doing anything you want, um, and you can be baptized ten times over, and you can be an imam, and you can be a maharashi. At the end of the day... <laughs> You're still a Jew. You're still a Jew. You're still just a Jew. Come back home and uh, get back to the synagogue. <laughs> get back on the team. Yeah. That ties yeah. in a little bit uh, with with your blog. I was checking out, uh, Rabbi. It's very, very good. I was really enjoying it. On the Times of Israel, we'll put up a link uh, to, to the Rabbi's Thank blog. You. But could you tell our listeners a little bit about the Helsinki consultation? <laughs> <laughs> so this actually does tie in a, a little to it. Um, you know, we Jews, um, we've had a long and kind of tumultuous relationship with the church. Right now, it's on a, in a great place. You know, we, we're really being accepted much more. And uh, the church is kind of saying, okay, there's, there's some room. They carved out some room for the Jewish people, which is really <laughs> nice of them. Um, and, and we're working together. And uh, that, that's really nice. Um, what we Jews don't like is these crossovers. You know, we recognize Judaism's its religion. Christianity moved away. They became their religion. Islam, their religion, you know, everyone's got their space. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> I'll respect it uh, as long as you don't, you know, so invade my space and then call it your own. That we don't like. You know, if you want to be Jewish, great. If you want to be a Jew, Jewish and then say, but I also believe in Jesus, man, you know, choose a path. That's just, <laughs> you know, it, it doesn't work that way. You got to You got to find your home and just run with it. Now, um, I was um, approached by my friend Eric the monk, uh, who who was in in, in contact with uh, these um, these people, the Helsinki cons consultation, and they were um, a group of Jews who have found Jesus and 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 were trying to spread that mission of what they call Yeshua or they go or whatever they call it they're trying to spread it and 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 develop that and they they are they kind of have a bit of a, a um an attitude because uh, no one likes them and we're trying to say yeah you're right no one like you know the christians don't like him and the jews don't <laughs> like him no one likes me and you know because you got to choose 
got to choose a, a home. It's Mets or Yankees, not both. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know, choose a team, live by that. And uh, so then they, they kind of want to, you know, they want to have their Judaism and their Jesus. And it just doesn't work. So they said, will you meet with us? I said, I'll meet with you, but you're really not going to like what I have to say. They said, no, no, no. You're the first guy that said you'll ever actually meet with us. <laughs> so I said, all right, if you want to meet. So we sat down and we started meeting and um, they did not like what I had to say. <laughs> you know, I, I gave it to them and I said, you know, I'm sorry. You're, you're doing a disservice to Judaism and to Christianity. Um, and um, I haven't heard from them since. So um, <laughs> I think that that's strange. Uh, yeah, that's that's how it works. That's how it goes. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to to ask it a little bit more. I know everybody's curious, especially a, a modern cool rabbi. How you actually observe uh, Shabbat and uh, the rules and what what just like what a day is like when you when you're observing it. I want to tell you guys that uh, Shabbat is the greatest gift given by God <laughs> to the world, and you really have to try it. I tell you, as someone who checks his phone a thousand times a day, you know, and it was always refreshing and it's always renewing. And it's always like I had this obsessive complex, like everyone in the world. I need to know what's going on and what's happening. Comes along Shabbat. I shut off for 25 hours. There's such freedom there that, uh, you know, it's, it's worth it to become Jewish just to have Shabbat. I mean, it's unbelievable. What do I do? First of all, I reacquaint myself with my family. You know? <laughs> I sit down and we, uh, the, the, here's the idea. Okay, quickly, sundown, um, you light candles, you know, and you put away all electronics and you put away all things that are going to lead uh, to a distraction. So mechanical from, devices as well? Mechanical devices, you know, no TVs and no, uh, and no electronics and no, you know, turning on lights and no, you know, no doing, no cars and no phones and no nothing okay it's just you you know going back before uh any modernity any new inventions now it's not like you could sit in the dark okay because if you can turn the lights on before shabbat and sit in the lights that's fine and if you have a crock pot and you cook some food before shabbat you can have some hot food that's fine but you can't do anything active and creative on that day so to be clear, you you have to turn the lights on before Shabbat, otherwise you're stuck in the dark. You're stuck in the dark. Oh, wow. You're stuck in the dark. And if you have the lights on and everything's fine and then something happens and there's a, a short and, the, and there are no lights, you're just <laughs> you sit in the dark. Uh, so, you know, Jews always try to find a way to, to, to fix their situation, but sometimes you're just stuck. I understand that Sabbath ends on Saturday when there are three stars spotted in the sky, I have to ask, what if it's really, really cloudy on Saturday? And Shabbat keeps on going, man. No, um, what uh, happens? <laughs> entirely possible. I, don't know. I could tell you anything, right? Uh, exactly. Um, but um, <laughs> uh, the, the three stars, the three stars represent nighttime. So the idea is that uh, you know when God created the world, so there's this idea it calls, and it was evening, and it was morning, and that was considered a day. So the day begins in Jewish law, the day begins in the evening. And, uh, the, and then, of course, the rabbis start asking, well, what is the definition of evening? And that's, you know, Talmudic rabbis, they started asking questions and, and they went on and on and on. And they ended up saying, OK, the definition of evening nighttime is when three stars come out. Now, yeah, in ancient times, they kind of uh, were a little bit stuck. They didn't have uh, exactly clocks and, you know, GPS and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but today, um, we, we have a schedule and we have uh, exact times throughout the world. In Krakow, by the way, it's one of the, the longest Shabbats in the world um, because of the way we are situated in, uh, on, near the equator or wherever we are. I don't know the story. Anyway, last night it went till 10 p.m. 10 p.m. Oh. So it's a it's a late long day. So you might put your kids to sleep. So we're getting away from the three stars thing. Is that what you're saying? We're 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 figuring out computer wise exactly when the three stars thing is, and and it's different uh -huh. in every place in the world. So you we have uh, you know uh, on the internet you can check a website where the three stars comes out, um, and you're you're good to go. There's a website. There's a website for that. There's an app for that, I'm sure, too. <laughs> There's an app for that. Uh, let me move on to another um, kind of a, a basic, a cornerstone of, of the Jewish identity and one that's familiar to um, 
the larger non non Jewish culture, uh, the uh, the concept of kosher. Concept of kosher. Now, for most people, they associate kosher with food, but in fact, kosher applies to many aspects of of daily life. Isn't that right? The word kosher was first found in one of the books of the Bible, um, where uh, the queen says, Queen Esther, from our story of Purim, she says to the king, if it's kosher in your eyes, okay? So uh, he wasn't talking about eating food. He was talk- she, she was talking about, is this acceptable? Is this proper? And therefore, it became, uh, in, in English, uh, the word kosher means, is it acceptable? Is it, is it good and, and, and appropriate? In fact, in the Bible, when it talks about kosher food, it never uses the word kosher. So there you have it. We just kind of like adopted that food that is done right, that we'll call kosher. And done right has a lot of different possibilities. Either it has to be slaughtered right, or it can't have bugs in it, or it can't have blood in it, or it can't be uh, touched by uh, unclean hands. There's a whole bunch of different things that relate to kosher. But when it comes down to it, kosher in Judaism relates to food. You're not going to say, you know, other types of kosher except certain, I don't know, writers like likes to be uh, dramatic and say kosher this or kosher that. But on the whole, uh, it, it automatically goes to food. If you say, I'm kosher, it's referring to your, your, what you're eating. Most people are familiar with the idea of uh, pork separation of meat products and milk products. I have to ask, I have to get your answer to this. Why does God care... If you eat pork, why does God care if you mix meat and milk? That's a great question. Well, thank you. Um, I have a meeting with him after this one. <laughs> so, I, I, you know, if you get me back here at uh, 1130. Um, Put it on our Facebook page, whatever it is. Okay, answer. okay. I'll give you the update. Um, the, the laws between man and man are very simple, very straightforward. Don't kill, don't steal, be nice, be kind, all this kind of stuff. It makes perfect sense to us. The laws to God, especially the laws like kosher and sacrifice and certain things that you're just doing for God doesn't give you an, an explanation. That's a little harder to, uh, to understand. Um, we can try, you know, and they did try throughout the Middle Ages. They tried to explain. Some offered the idea that it makes you healthier and some of the ideas that you are what you eat. And they came along with these ideas. Uh, Maimonides gave the, uh, the approach of uh, it, it relates to uh, idol worship and therefore it's trying to remove you. And say, yeah. There are all these different possibilities. When it comes down to it, there are certain things you throw yourselves up, your, your hands up and you say, okay, this is part of being Jewish. You know, this is what I do. It is what it is. It is what it is. And what kosher does actually, and it's, it's a pretty amazing thing, regardless of the kind of food that you're eating, okay? You go into a store, right? A supermarket. You say, what do I want to eat? Okay? I, say, I go into a store. I say, what can I eat? What am I allowed to eat? I'm in a constant state of separating, of looking and figuring out, What's what I'm allowed to do, what I'm not allowed to do. It's a different approach of, to how you live your life. It creates a bit of a psychosis. It creates a nervous, uh, you know, Jewish uh, mentality. But it is something that divides us and, and, and kind of keeps us uh, on our toes. Absolutely. I think you, you touched on something there I just want to go back to about how universal the Ten Commandments are. You know, it's really one of the great contributions to uh, human society that, that comes from Judaism. And I, I, was, also, I was also just wondering if, if it's okay to say, you know, I've always thought Moses as a Catholic is, is the coolest character in the Bible. You know, he's got this kind of... Uh, I don't know, this, this kind of, he's, got, he's dealing with a lot of different problems. It's a whole adventure story, leading everyone out of Egypt, etc. And uh, when he gets the Ten Commandments, I mean, this is, this is a huge moment in, in human history. And I'd just like to, maybe if you could talk a bit about the legacy of, uh, of such a basic and universal law. The legacy of Moses or the legacy of the Ten Commandments? Both. Both. Oh, can I add on to that? Can I make it more complicated? But adding on the fact that a lot of people don't know that, in fact, correct me if I'm wrong, in Judaism, there are 613 commandments. Yeah. Yeah, 613. Now, no yeah. offense to you, Rabbi, but I, I'm having trouble believing that anybody can kind of, you know, mentally list the 613 commandments and instantly identify which one is being broken as they see it being broken. Come on. 
<laughs> you, you, you violated the 337th commandment there. Oh, no. that's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> that is a good one. Oh. One of your favorites. Huh? Oh, man. Oh, man. <laughs> Classic commandment. Okay. Okay. Um, so just pretend there was a question in there and, and run yeah, with it. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I hear it. I hear it. Um, Jews, you know, when, when when we teach our kids, we don't say, you know, as you're starting to learn, let me teach you the Ten Commandments. It's not like that. The Ten Commandments were simply, at the time, a taste of what's to come. So there's commandments that are faith-oriented. Number one, believe in God. Number two, no idols. Number three, less uh, appreciated by all, don't take God's name in vain. We don't really, you know, not excited about that. Um, you know, four and five or four is like, uh, honor your parents. So then there comes that moral, uh, idea, which is cool. Then comes along five and it's like, uh, Shabbat, you know, and Shabbat, and Shabbat, uh, is, uh, is really between you and God. Then we hit into the whole section of don'ts, all right? Don't kill, don't steal, don't testify, uh, in vain or lie about it. And don't uh, covet, no adultery. So there's, it's like this nice mix mm -hmm. of all different types of, uh, of, of the 613. If you have to collect, you know, the, the uh, 10 that you would like to just talk about at Mount Sinai without boring everyone. It's the greatest hits, the singles it, it's, collection. It's the greatest hits. <laughs> it's the greatest hits. And, you know, when it comes down to it, you know, there's only a small group that are listening to, like, the, you know, the, the second track of the, you know, the, the, <laughs> the, the, the stuff that they came out with. Everyone likes the greatest hits. Yeah. And that's where it becomes uh, the, big, uh, the big legacy. But, um, listen, Moses, uh, you know, it was interesting. The, the the Bible says that God starts speaking and the people are freaking out and was like, "This is we can't hit, listen to God." So they say, "Okay, Moses, you teach us the rest." And Moses becomes the law giver. And Moses' legacy is Exodus and the giving of the law. Mm -hmm. And then they wandered for forty years in the desert, and that was a, a, a tough one. And um, but uh, that's part of the legacy of Moses. He's one hundred and twenty years old, and he wants to go into this promised land. And God says, "No." And that moment where he just accepts and submits, that's heroic in itself. Really? And I like that he had a bit of a temper, too. He did have a bit of a temper. <laughs> yeah. You know, he started out slaying the, the uh, Egyptian, and uh, he, doesn't, he didn't take anything from anyone. He was a pretty cool dude. He yeah. was. Yeah. I think he's, he's my, you know, spiritual I leader so. of cool dudeism. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Rabbi, in the time we have left, I want to make sure we get to a couple of questions uh, that came up in our previous interviews particularly when we were speaking with uh, Marciana Kubala of Hula, Hello Krakow, a couple of things came up. We, we really need some clarifications, and you're just the man to do this, I think. Uh, what's the story with Judaism and tattoos? Can you be buried in a Jewish cemetery if you have tattoos and so on? Yeah, you can be buried in a Jewish cemetery if you have tattoos. Um, you, uh, you're not supposed to get a tattoo. Uh, that, it just says it in the Torah. We can go with, do the why explicitly. again. It says it explicitly. Oh. It says it, you know, don't make a tattoo. <laughs> it just just with clear. those words. It's pretty clear. Pretty straightforward. In ancient times, people weren't writing love on their bodies and they weren't drawing little flowers on their bodies. It probably had what to do with idolatry and the like. And therefore, it was part of a group of commandments that say, don't be like them. But uh, then it became kind of like this... Uh, this idea that if you if you're gonna start to, um, defaming your body, then uh, we won't accept you. But uh, no, no, people, we bury people. With that. All right. Another complicated subject that came up was uh, facial hair in Judaism. Facial hair and hair on your head—it's complicated. Um, I uh, uh, it's very close to my heart because um, I have facial hair, but I'm losing the hair on my head, so I'm kind of a <laughs> bit, um, you know, uh, sensitive about this issue. I don't understand the question. Uh, you, uh, well, why, why some rabbis have are almost required to have it seems oh. uh, beards. Oh, you enough. don't. Why not? Uh, similar to the tattoo, um, there was a there's a law to um, that you're not allowed to use a razor to um, make a circle around your head. And if you think about the monks of old, they had a, like a bit of a bald mm -hmm. spot, right? So I feel that 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 was not like the idolatry was doing that. They took the the knife to their to their heads, to their faces. So um, Jews don't take knives to their hair on their faces or, or, or on their head. Um, 
and you'll you'll notice that I'm somewhat uh, clean shaven, and you'll ask, well, what's the deal, right? What's the deal? So, all, so the Hasidim they took this very seriously, and then they're they're just hairy all over, yeah. and that, that's what they do. We came up with a with, with a, a, a way around it, um, and we we sometimes do that, and it's part of the rabbinic acceptance. And they said, okay, I don't take a blade to my beard. I don't take a blade to my head. I can use scissors. Scissors is not taking a blade to it. I can cutting, I'm cutting the pieces around it. So yeah, it's splitting hairs, but, um, <laughs> but, um, but definitely sound effect drum roll. For yeah. Thank you. But, um, for me, um, who I, I, my wife won't kiss me if I have hair on my face. So I, it's pretty important that I, uh, that I, Follow this lenient ruling. So this is connected with the issue. I forgot the proper term. We call them forelocks. What do you? What's the proper term for um, the little curls? I, the, I, I think that's oh. it's called dreadlocks. Dreadlocks or dreadlocks? No, no, that's it, different. Um, it's <laughs> called uh, yeah, uh, peot. Which, that's right. Okay, uh, um, so that, why, that's, why does, that's a Hasidic custom. That's right. Only that, Hasidic. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a Hasidic custom. I have them. I mean, they're just not as cool, right? It's just that. We have this hair that's on the side of our, uh, by our temple. Uh, we're not supposed to shave that. That was part of the original prohibition. So I, I might use a, an electric shaver that's just a scissor, but I'm not allowed to use a razor. And I'm told that razors are really good and nice and clean. Scissor, so yes, I, razor, Very no. expensive, though. I mean, it, I'll never understand the cost of a Mac tree blade. Uh, somebody needs to investigate. It's ridiculous. Um, you know? I, I wouldn't know. I use the scissors, too. Okay, there you go. <laughs> you got, you got Just because I'm cheap. Rabbi, what do you think about uh, Jews celebrating Christmas? Um, that's a no-no. Um, uh, that's, uh, that's, it's a symbol of Christianity. It go, falls into my category of the Helsinki thing. Yeah. Uh, but I want to tell you a quick joke. Uh, and this kind of sums up uh, the uh, the idea of what what I was talking about. Jew and a, and a uh, non-Jew were friends. They were kids, and they uh, they said, "Hey, let's celebrate, or let's at least come over, and I'll teach you about my different days." So he comes over to Hanukkah, and uh, he sees the the menorah, and he's learning, looking about, it, learning about it. And the father does, and the son does, and the daughter does. Everyone having a good time, and he you know spins the dreidel and he eats the latkes, and it's all done. So he said, "Come over to my house." He comes over to his house, and there's a big Christmas tree. And uh, it looks really cool, really interesting. And then the Jewish kid says, how tall does a tree have to be? Oh, I ever tell you one tree. And how many ornaments do you have to have on the tree? <laughs> I don't know, just put ornaments on it. And who's allowed to put an ornament on the tree? <laughs> says, I don't know, you're just going to do it. And does it have to be on the lower part or does it have to be on the upper part? It's like, why do you keep asking questions? I'm sorry, this is what Judaism is about. So that is really what we do. You know, we just uh, ask the hell out of, quest uh, out of these laws. But we don't do the Christmas thing. We don't do the, the, the Hanukkah bush. We, we, we try to make a separation. I respect your religion. I respect your place. Respect mine. Mm -hmm. And let's try not to have a crossover. One more thing that's familiar to the larger non-Jewish uh, culture, you might say, uh, is the concept of bar mitzvah and bat mitzvah for boys and girls. As I understand, it's 13 for boys, but 12 for girls. Why the difference? Is it rooted in biological differences, or is there another reason for that? Biological girls more mature faster, and therefore um, we kind of recognize that the girls get to an age of reason and an age of responsibility at a, <laughs> a faster level. My daughter is is twelve, had her bat mitzvah, and uh, congratulations! She was much more uh, impressive than uh, my son, who was uh, at thirteen. <laughs> so she she did a great job. She wrote a book for her bat mitzvah. Wow. So she was she was impressive uh, in that regard. So yeah. That, Speaking of girls, called. women, I should say, uh, in some some forms of Judaism, uh, there are women female rabbis. Uh, do you accept this, or do certain do all Jews recognize female rabbis? Are we getting into some deep water here, or what? Yeah, it is. It is one of those uh, touchy subjects because uh, the rabbi has been associated with a man, and then came along the conservative and reform movement, and they said hey, we can do it too. And when that happens, Orthodox recoils and they start circling the wagons and they say, "Hey, you know, we're not we're not doing things." Uh, even if it might be a good idea, we're not going to go and do it because it's like that. The truth is, though, that um, over uh, over time, there were always the rabbi and the rabbi's wife, and she was taking on a lot of these roles. You know, if she was teaching mm -hmm. and if she was telling young women what to do and if she was uh, getting involved. And nowadays, more and more Orthodox women are getting involved in 
doing the same type of activities that men are doing. I want to hear a woman teaching me from the Torah. I want to, I want to hear that. My wife wants to get a woman to teach her or to, to tell her what to do so that she doesn't feel uncomfortable about a man. I think we're going in the direction that we're going to have roles for men and women that are able to do it uh, along the same way in an equal fashion. Whether we'll call her a rabbi or not, my daughter, when she comes of age, whether she'll be called a rabbi or not, I think it's immaterial. Whether she's going to have a role as a spiritual leader, I'm convinced. And it's a, it's a tough question in all religions. It seems to be, uh, you know, an issue in, uh, in Christianity as well. Rabbi, you've been extremely generous with your time. We so know you've, generous. We've got to get you out of here. I know you've got things to do. Uh, we have a lot of questions remaining, but you know what? We'll, we'll leave those for part two of our conversation to come another My day. My pleasure. My Thank pleasure. So it was a lot much. of fun. And I wish you guys uh, have a great day. And uh, shalom to you all. Shalom.